we're going to do is have a conversation. I want to introduce two of Fuller's faculty who are going to take a few minutes just to briefly uh, respond to what Thomas shared. Then they're, we're going to share in some conversation together, and then we will eventually also include an opportunity to interact with your questions, which you can text and which will ultimately be questions that will appear uh, up on the screen. So let me first introduce Marianne Mai Thompson. She's the George Eldon Ladd Professor of New Testament at Fuller. She's been a part of our faculty since 1985, um, a very uh, respected and beloved person and a person whose scholarship in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John, has been uh, very, very significant. Tommy Givens, a much newer part of our faculty, professor, assist, Assistant Professor of New Testament. Also someone who, in a very short period of time, has left a very significant mark on the lives of students that he's touched, and his work is likewise in the New Testament. So we have an opportunity to first to just hear briefly from them as they respond and interact a little bit with what Tom has just shared, and then we'll have some conversation together. So Marianne, let me ask you if you would please go first. Uh let me just begin by saying thank you for being with us. And uh, you will probably not remember this, but in 2001, I wrote you an email <laughs> thanking you for two different books on Jesus. One was the book you had co-written with Marcus Borg, which I was using in a master's class, and one was Jesus and the Victory of God, which I was using in a doctoral seminar. And, and, and just to say thank you for the ways that your historically sensitive work had made it possible for many of us to read the Gospels anew with passion and uh, it was a great contribution, and I, and, and I feel much the same way tonight about the way you have helped us to read Paul afresh, so thank you. First, a story and then a kind of a question about, well, a few years ago when I was in college, my first uh, <laughs> uh, professor of New Testament was Gordon Fee. And Gordon once said in class, in the context of a class on Paul, I think, or New Testament theology, if I could only have two epistles from Paul or maybe the New Testament, I would take Galatians and Philemon. Galatians because it shows you what the gospel is and Philemon because it shows you it works. And I have re always remembered this, but it dawned on me recently. I remembered it without actually having any idea of what he probably meant when he said that. And in my mind, I probably thought he meant something like the gospel tells us how we get saved and Philemon tells us you know, what, that, that, we, that we, we were reconciled to each other. But it had never occurred to me, I think, to see the connection so closely or to think that Galatians also told us both aspects of the story, the way Philemon told us both aspects of the story. And you highlight that well in your book uh, when you talk about Philemon. I think what, what I am interested to maybe get you to talk a little bit more about is the idea that you say Paul effectively invented Christian theology. And I think we could probably add um, to characterize your position for, for community formation, for community stability, for the life, life of the community. Now, invented is a, uh, what? A deliberately provocative word, I suspect. Uh, it's a strong claim you're staking, as is the, the use of the term theology itself, that what he invents is theology, because I think a number of times we read in books on Paul, you know, he's not a systematic theologian. Sure, he did some pastoral theology and so on. So I wonder, I'm thinking of a couple of things. One is the, um, how much it matters, or could you talk a little bit more about the idea that Paul invented this, and I'm thinking, for example, of you talk about monotheism, election, and eschatology. In many ways, you could argue that Jesus himself addresses each of those issues in ways that get him in trouble and that could seem to be dangerous nonsense when he talks about ways in which the people of God is reconfigured. Or when Paul talks about monotheism, um, you yourself build on the work of uh, Richard Bauckham and Larry Hurtado and Martin Hengel and others who say, you know, before Paul ever wrote a word, there had been an explosion in Christological thought so that they were already rethinking categories of monotheism. And then I think about letters like Hebrews, which is doing something not unlike what Paul is doing, um, or even 1 Peter, which is telling a story about uh, the way, it, what it means to live in Christ. 
And so I'm thinking of both the before and the after Paul, and even into the apostolic fathers. You know, did, did they forget everything Paul said? Did, how do they remember it? How does that shape them? But it's just a way of, of asking the question when you say invented Christian theology or the first Christian theologian, where are you sort of willing to let that bleed, you know, into the past and into the future and, and, and gather up some strands of what other Christians were already struggling to do? Did Paul just do it better? You know, you talk about Paul in his Jewish and his pagan context, and no one was doing this, but were Christians doing it, you know, and, and how does Paul fit into that scenario? So maybe we can uh, get some chance to get you to talk about that invented and then exactly what it is that he invented when he invented theology. Mm. Nice question. Yeah. You want me to respond? Sorry, I couldn't remember how we're doing this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marianne. That, that's, that's, um, I confess I had completely forgotten that email from 2001, <laughs> but it's nice. With, with all kinds of warnings from Westminster Abbey, I think, about how this wasn't official or anything. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 quite likely. Um, w when I read Paul and read other writers, both before him and after him, um, and it may just be because I've studied Paul intensively and I haven't studied, say, First Peter as intensively as I've studied, say, Romans. Um, but even Hebrews, which I think is a brilliant piece of writing, an extraordinary piece of writing, I think Paul is a towering intellect on a par with, I would say, Plato or Aristotle, um, in that he's pulling to... That was a good squeal. That was exactly <laughs> what we needed just then. Um, yeah, yay, let's hear it from... Um, the... the, the um, uh, the sense of the range and the depth and the and the subtlety of his biblical use, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is just massive. And I don't think intellects like that come along very yeah. often. And I, I don't think it would be plausible to say that there were unknown figures prior to Paul who were doing exactly this kind of thing. Um, yes, Jesus, of course, is in his parables, in his teachings, in what he's doing. He is addressing those issues of what's God up to now. What is the kingdom of God looking like? But I don't think he is in the same way um, urging people to a particular task in the way that Paul is urging his community. It's like, the, you know, Jesus never addressed the issue of circumcision. That's just one example. But, but mm -hmm. um, it, you don't need to until you're right. out there in the, in the Gentile world. And, and Paul is faced with a new challenge of holding together and sanctifying this very different community that though I believe Jesus envisaged that there would be such a mm. community, Jesus wasn't doing yeah. that yet. He was doing something very bound in his, into his own particular uh, agenda. So... In terms of Paul's immediate predecessors, yes, it's perfectly possible because actually one of the interesting things, and I don't think I've said this tonight, I don't think I'll say it tomorrow necessarily, is that when Paul is talking about his very high Christology, it doesn't seem to be controversial. He never has to sort of argue it or make a fuss about it or say, now some of you haven't quite grasped this. It seems to be common coin, yeah. one God, one Lord, etc. And that means, yes, there had been an explosion already. What I think he invented, and I'll stick by that word at least for tonight for the sake of argument, keep you awake, um, is um, the, the theology as a, as a task, as an activity, this challenge to a community um, to be renewed in mind so that thus and only thus could they grasp this. So, I mean, he is then gathering up stuff that was already going on, exegesis that was going on at least from Jesus on the road to Emmaus, you know, in, interpreting all the scriptures concerning himself. So, in a sense, Paul is the heir of that, but he's drawing it together and shaping it as an agenda, as a task, as a way of life for a community. And I really do think that, as far as we know, is new, um, so that his interlocutors in Antioch, in the incident recorded in Galatians, I think he would say their real problem is they haven't started to think Christianly. They're just uh, winging it with bits and pieces of this and that. In terms of his successors, um, I mean, yes, Hebrews, yes, First Peter, yes, Revelation in a very different mode, but very rich theology. But um, I think they are continuing a work which Paul is the pioneer for. Um, one of the sort of disappointments that I have when I read, say, Ignatius of Antioch, I have a huge respect for Ignatius of Antioch but but you know he's intellectually he's just not on the not in the same league at all he's a wonderful faithful wise interesting guy but but he's not doing the same kind of multi-layered subtle stuff and I think the other thing is in terms of the engagement that Paul seems to be modeling and taking forward um, something which is hugely interesting in terms of 
as he says, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. I, I just don't think that's, as far as we can tell, going on before. And it's because he's earthing this community in this task that he's able actually to look and I mean, Paul knew the world of ancient philosophy. He lived in Tarsus, which is one of its main centers. Um, so he's able to engage with Stoic ideas. He's able to engage with what's going on on the street and with political and cultural ideas as well. I don't know that anyone before Paul is really articulating the gospel in such a way that it is absolutely in your face to Caesar in the way that I think it is. Uh, in a subtle way, not, not in a kind of a low grade way, but, but in, in a sort of outflanking way. Um, that Jesus is Lord um, and Caesar isn't, you know, I, I, not in, I say not in a cheap and cheerful way, but in quite a subtle and interesting way. And I, I think these are all part of what Paul would see as the theological task. And when people say he isn't a systematic theologian, that's a kind of a mantra, by the way, in New Testament studies. It's one of the entry tickets that you have to say when you sign on as a member of SBL. Paul was not a systematic <laughs> Okay, you're in, you'll do. No. Um, and... And what that, what that means is we learned some theology in Sunday school and it was very neat and packaged. And then we started to study Paul in college and it was much more interesting than that. So it's basically a way of saying we've escaped from the little box before. But actually, Paul is a huge, massive, sprawling thinker. But when you get into his world, the stuff joins up in the most amazing way. And it seems to me some of the greatest systematic theologians um, in many traditions have done what Paul did, lots and lots of occasional pieces, yeah. which nevertheless bear witness to it. I was talking about Leslie Newbegin with somebody today at lunchtime, and Leslie never wrote a systematic theology, but Leslie was a coherent thinker on many fronts. So I think Paul is doing that kind of thing. Tommy, let's have an opportunity to hear from you. Thank you, and a uh, similar thanks for being with us and the presentation tonight. And in my case, I feel like I owe a special uh, word of thanks because I've grown up in some ways as a Christian under your influence. Uh, so I was exposed to you relatively early in seminary, and it's been life-giving. Uh, it's also caused me a hell of a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> so... I'm still picking up some of the pieces. I want to direct your attention to two subjects that you touched on in various ways in your presentation, uh, Judaism and politics. And my intent here is to offer a little critical pushback, uh, but anticipating because I know where you're coming from, how you might elaborate what you've said. First, Judaism, uh, as you know well, and you mentioned Bart several times, Karl Bart, in your presentation, uh, Christians have made a life out of building their account of God and their life together on the backs of Jews. And you've given us various gestures towards the ways in which Paul remains a Jew, in which Paul is appealing to the Jewish past, to the fulfillment of the Jewish prophets, and yet, at the same time, there is an abiding concern to distinguish what Paul is doing uh, from Judaism. Uh, and you've acknowledged that there's a variety of Judaisms going on and whatnot. But the reason I think this is so significant is that, and this is going to flow into the politics question, uh, this uh, sort of, we are the new people of God, and everything that we have gained, we gained uh, at the loss of the Jews, um, or so it has been, and so much of the Christian reception of Paul has generated a massive, massive political fallout, not only against Jews in particular, uh, but also uh, giving whole societies a sense of being the new Israel. This is part of our own history here in North America, your own from Great Britain, and a sense that we somehow embody exclusively the people of God having disinherited the Jews uh, from that and as a result uh, possessing a sort of knowledge of God that allows us to police the world, to conform it to our image uh, because we are now the one people of God. So how do we uh, read Paul so as to subvert this kind of violent political legacy? Hmm. Uh, that's a question that I'd love for you to respond to. It flows into the politics question because, as you probably know, we're in the midst of a significant immigration debate uh, here in the U.S. 
and some of us advocating strongly for uh, a change in law that would provide much more favorable conditions uh, for people who have migrated to this country from various parts of the world, but especially from Latin America. And part of the reason that has been so difficult is that it seems that the society here in the U.S. has come to believe itself entitled uh, to a set of goods that we should protect against those who are coming from without. And so it has made life in many ways a living hell for immigrants uh, who are not a part of the one nation under God uh, here in the U.S. So politically speaking, you talked about how uh, unlike much of what we have been saying about Paul since the 16th century and before, uh, there is a strong political edge to what Paul is saying relative to uh, Roman imperial authority. And there's also a political nature to the sort of community that he's in the business of forming by the power of this gospel that he is claiming. It's very popular today. We're all uh, very quick to be anti-empire. You know, we're anti-US empire. We're enlightened, this sort of thing. But I think that's much too easy. And Paul is in the business of a very subtle kind of politics, it seems to me. So you talk about how this gospel of Paul's has political ramifications at all levels. And I wonder if you might elaborate a little bit on that so that we wouldn't find ourselves playing into a sort of uh, political gospel that simply reinforces the existing structures of society today and claims them for Christ. Uh, Paul, it seems to me to be as much more subversive than that. And this is where maybe you could say a little bit about how the cross of Jesus and what that means for how we relate to those who threaten us lies at the very heart of the politics of Paul's gospel. Wow, thank you. Great questions. And um, <laughs> the, the super questions, thank you very much. And the, the, I'm afraid the short answer, and, I, and as you will know, is um, that chapter 12 of the book is all about the political <laughs> issue. Yeah. And, and chapter, I mean, the, the reason I say that is this, that it'll be impossible in the next sure. two or three minutes for me to nuance exactly as I would wish to all the fine tuning that would really be required for those splendid questions. And, and in chapter 15, I've struggled as best I can with the, the first of your questions, the question about Paul and um, his Jewish world and how all that plays out. And obviously, again, the short Pauline answer to that one is Romans 9 to 11. And um, it does seem to me, I mean, let's put it like this. If Paul had not believed that the community that believed in Jesus was the single family that God promised to Abraham, then he really made a big blunder in the way that he wrote Galatians 3 or Romans 4 or whatever. If he believed that actually, yeah, the Jews were doing their own thing and we were doing something quite different, he should just have said, um, then why you guys are talking about Abraham because that's irrelevant. And some people would have liked him to have said that. And here, here's the oddity about the whole sort of church and the Jews thing. If you talk about fulfillment, from some points of view, you're actually affirming the goodness and God-givenness of the Jewish traditions. And then you're saying, and God has brought these to this surprising fulfillment. And we are grateful for that. If you don't do that and you say, um, no, we are doing something completely different, then what you're effectively doing is inventing a non-Jewish sort of religion, which quickly, history shows, non-Jewish sorts of religion become anti-Jewish sorts yeah. of religion. Um, so you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, the, the, the critical move, which I think is much easier for us to see now because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, is to say that throughout the Second Temple period, there were many Jewish movements who were claiming explicitly or implicitly that God was renewing the covenant with them and not elsewhere. Um, when we had the discussion at the International SPL meeting last year, and we, we hit this point in discussion between Marty de Boer and Marcus Bockmuehl, with myself sort of in between the two, Marcus Bockmuehl said remarkably, he said, well, Qumran was supersessionist. He said, um, you know, the, the, the Bar Kokhva revolt was supersessionist because it's claiming that Bar Kokhva is the Messiah, and unless you follow him, you're not being a true Jew. And then he even said, um, the Mishnah is supersessionist because it's saying, this is what Judaism is now to look like, and anyone who thinks it looks differently, you know, Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1, you've got all Israel has a share in the age to come, except, 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 except. People who say this do that. You know, the, so John Levinson says at one point, I think I quote him in the book, 
that the most Jewish thing about early Christianity is its supersessionism. Um, and I think that that's Im an important paradox to grasp onto, because at that time, lots of people are saying, <clears throat> God is renewing the covenant with us, and that means that, well, either he is or he isn't. And if we're right, then that means this is where it's all happening. And we, we are worried about other Jews who aren't in, and we wish they would come and join us. And I think that's exactly where Paul is starting in Romans 9. <clears throat> if this isn't the case, why his tears in Romans 9? Why his heart's desire and prayer for them in Romans 10? He could have said, um, but I realize I shouldn't pray that prayer because it's silly or something. So you have to wrestle with that. Now, here's the problem. The, 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 the situation you describe, I think, came out, well, partly under Constantine. I know it's fashionable in America to knock Constantine, but as you said yourself about other things, that's just too cheap and cheerful. It, 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 history is more complicated. You know, face it, if you've been persecuted out of your skulls for 250 years, and then the emperor comes and says to you, actually, there's rather a lot of you, maybe we better allow you to be an official religion or something, you're not going to say, oh, oh no, please go on persecuting us because it's so much more authentic for us to be a beleaguered minority. You know, you, you know, you know, you're going to say, okay, this is going to be difficult. We're not sure we're going to manage it. We'll make some mistakes, but we'll give it a go. And that's what they did. Now, but ever since then, um, that question of if we're right, then the Jews are wrong, so let's get rid of them. Um, that got traction because the church forgot Romans 9 to 11. And I think if you go back through the exegetical tradition, you will see that Romans 9 to 11 was either forgotten or misused as a bit of dogma about um, election or something, rather than actually wrestling with the issue Paul's wrestling with. And then the situation you describe in terms of nations considering themselves to be the chosen people arises particularly with 17th and 18th century post-millennialism, it seems to me. Um, and it's actually a peculiarly modern phenomenon. It may have happened before, but I think it was particularly in the modern period. And then it gets special traction from the Enlightenment and the nations that are founded on Enlightenment, i.e. America and France particularly, modern Germany to a lesser extent, um, they actually say, we are now the enlightened ones. And you put together the post-millennial sense of we are the new Israel with the enlightenment sense of we are the superior ones because we're enlightened. And then you have big trouble. And that does play out in precisely into the political issues you're talking about. But as we unpick that and see all the strands by which we've got into the muddles that we've got to, it seems to me that's when we have to go back to the first century and say, there isn't a genealogy that goes straight from Paul into this stuff. Yes, we have to take responsibility for where we've got to, but that doesn't mean we have to play fast and loose with what Paul is actually saying in order to fiddle th those books to correct our current mistakes. They need correcting somewhere quite, quite else. Last remark, but this conversation can go on a long time, obviously, mm -hmm. but, but this is an important remark. In the so-called new perspective on Paul since the 70s, we have learned that Paul was addressing first century questions, not 16th century ones. And that's very hard for some people to get hold of. Now that we've discovered that Paul is relevant politically as well, there's a real danger we will make the same mistake, mm -hmm. and hence some of the easy, cheap and cheerful anti-empire things, of imagining that if Paul is writing about politics, he's writing about our politics. Mm -hmm. He isn't. Paul was innocent of the left-right spectrum that we think about. Paul, Paul was, you know, he just, they just didn't live in that world. And we need to examine much more closely how their political structures and power structures worked in order to see what purchase Paul's critique had there. And there I fully agree with you that for Paul to put the cross in the middle of the picture is just explosive. The cross was a weapon of imperial oppression. Um, and to take that and to say that actually it's the sign of the kingdom of God... Um, that goes on and on and on into all kinds of other issues. We could go on, but that's probably, yeah. We want to save some time for the audience to be able to ask some questions, but let me just be sure that we've got a, another little piece of what you've said tonight clear before we go on, because it seems so foundational to what you're going to continue to say. You've talked about Paul as the inventor of, of Christian theology, and you've talked at, at a number of points about the significance of mind, of the transformation of our mind. 
like uh, the rereading of history through the 16th century rather than the first century, I want to be sure that we're hearing your use of mind, not through the 18th century, but through the first century. So when you say Paul is calling us to the transformation of our minds, what does that mean? Especially I'm thinking of how easy it is in a, in a context in which in a postmodern world, the critique of mind and of the, the emptiness and, and limitations of reason are so much at stake. It seems particularly important that we understand what it is that's actually happening. Is your... Uh, call or Paul's call to us an intellectual call of reason or is it something more and if it's something more then in what way is it more it's a both and probably but how would you respond to yeah, that uh, of, uh, of course it's a both and I'm an Anglican that's what we do um, <laughs> the, um, it, this is hugely complex of course because the words Paul uses like noose and so on and phronesis um, and similar words which he plays around with and does different things, especially, as I said, in Philippians. Very interestingly, why there? That's a good question. Um, uh, these have their resonances within the world of Plato and Aristotle, within the worlds of Stoicism, etc. Um, and they have to be studied carefully within that context. But again and again, precisely because he's talking about the renewing of the mind, like the whole virtue reborn thing, um, it, it's, it's about... Paul seeing that this is part of what it means to be a God-given human being and that being transformed or being grown up in your thinking, um, as in 1 Corinthians 14, um, he seems to be reaching after... And I think, he, I think what he's saying is, in the resurrection, God has launched his new creation. A new world has come into being and there must be new modes of knowing appropriate for that. It's like when when the astronomers speculate that there may be some object out there zillions of miles away and they haven't got telescopes that can see it yet, but they will invent new forms of observation appropriate for the new stuff which they think is out there. In the same way, it seems to me the new world, it's like Jesus saying, unless one is born again, one cannot see the kingdom of God. It seems to me there's something to do with a new form of knowing which is appropriate for the new world that is beginning. Now, that form of knowing then takes up the existing forms of knowing and transcends and transforms them in the same way that Jesus' dead body after the crucifixion was taken up and transformed into being uh, a now a non-corrupting body that was equally at home in heaven and on earth. And it seems to me what Paul is talking about is is that the whole human being, including the mind, whatever precisely we mean by that, can, can be taken up in that way. Now, of course, we are the heirs of 18th century rationalism, if we're not careful, or um, postmodern anti-rationalism. And I think um, the danger there was that rationalism exalted one form of knowing, a sort of calculating form of knowing, and made it the be-all and end-all in a way which was incredibly destructive and reductive and negative. One of the great advantages of postmodernity, it seems to me, is that we've thrown all the cards in the air and now at last we've actually said to ourselves, as some of us were saying last night, that things like imagination and music and art go together with thinking. It's not that we do that stuff over there and then we do the thinking over here. There is a much bigger, and I think that's to do with new creation. And so despite the negativity of postmodernity, I see all sorts of possibilities. Um, and I see Christian theology as taking its place cheerfully within that larger mix of, of music, of imagination, of culture, and, and so on, and of the whole of society. We know things in a wide variety of ways. And I think we know that we know things in a wide variety of ways. It's just that philosophers often have talked as though it's just this little thing called reason. So I think the transformed mind is to do with taking up those God-given faculties and praying that we will be enabled to love God with our minds. And the fact that it's odd to th for in the rationalistic world to think about love and mind in the same sentence shows what is required for this transformation. Um, all, all I've really done is stir the pot about three times in different directions, but I hope that's enough so, to, so to keep it cooking. I do want to push it on a, a bit more because you've given it to us as the central call of the church to do this work of theology. So let me just ask this. Are you saying then that the work of doing theology is this integrated act of, of how we perceive ourselves, our neighbor, and God. 
and integrate it into our life and our action. Is that, and it happens for different people in different capacities. I'm just thinking of the range of yeah, intellect. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. certainly not saying this is for the most elite intellects. You're, you actually specifically said it was uh, not that. So help us understand yeah, what that I, means. I'm saying it's a task for the whole church. And, and the task of theology, as I think Paul conceives it, is scriptural, it's prayerful, it's communal, it's, it's engaged with the world, but it's to do with the reflection uh, which, again, comes into and out of worship, reflection of who exactly God is. And that's, you might think that that's a given. We say the creeds, we know who God is. Well, actually, no, we don't, because um, John says, um, no one has ever seen God. It's the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father. He's made him known. And Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. And so the quest to know God is the quest to find out more about who Jesus is, and we will never get to the end of that. I mean, it's, it's just a constant thing. And, and it's one of those things, again, to use the telescope and astronomy metaphor, that as we mature as Christians, um, the telescope gets either cleaned or gets better lenses or something, and we are able to perceive more of who God is. But we, that's not an individual thing. We, can't, we need one another to do it. And so teachers within the church and the body of Christ together in local things, in a local Bible study or in a church synod or whatever, this is the task that we must always be doing. The danger that, I mean, what I'm pushing against is the idea that you can get unity or church organization um, by committee, by decision, whatever, without the prayerful scripture-based wrestling with these big questions. Um, you know, when the big questions come as they do in every generation to the church, the answer is not, let's have a committee to sort this one out. <clears throat> it's, we, uh, uh, interesting point. When John Zizulus came to the Church of England General Synod once, and he saw us debating all manner of things, then some of us had lunch with him. <clears throat> and his point was, is, uh, as a Greek Orthodox, he said, this is very interesting, but it is not a synod. Hmm. Because for him, a synod would have been about prayer and worship and so on, and wrestling with the issues much more overtly and explicitly within that context. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if there would be a way of sharpening our sense of the task of theology insofar as it involves the mind in relation to Paul with the very texts that have figured so prominently in your presentation, Romans 12, Philippians 2. Uh, we have the use of nous there for mind in Romans 12, phronesis, phroneo in Philippians 2. And in both cases, the argument does not turn after there is this imperative about the transformation of the mind or the adoption of the mentality of Christ to an activity that is happening behind a desk. It very quickly moves to the way that we treat one another. Exactly. How will you regard exactly. yourselves in exactly. relation to one another? Don't regard yourselves higher than you ought. And then in Romans 12, flowing very quickly into this vision of the community as a united body. And then in Philippians 2, a mentality of self-giving that is able to be hospitable in the face of great difficulty. Uh, so that sense of intellectual formation that is actually uh, dependent, forged in a certain kind of social interaction and dynamic, I think is a, a notion of intellectual formation that's quite alien to what counts as theology in most of our minds. And so to talk about mind in those more explicitly social terms, I think could help sharpen what we mean by theology as transformation of the mind. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And and actually, um, I think it's tomorrow morning's lecture. I do go to Philippians 2 with that exactly in mind. In mind. Um, and uh, But you could also go to Romans 8, where it's the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. And, and the, the Philippians passage is about unity and the Romans passage is about holiness. And again and again, these two themes just keep coming up. And if you're not thinking in this renewed way, unity and holiness are just not going to happen. But, I mean, just as an example, I have found in my own life that as a pastor, I will sometimes say I'm preparing three or four people for confirmation or something. Some of the issues that they raise and that I'm wrestling with or talking some, with someone pastorally, it, it draws out of me stuff that I didn't know was there and which I will then think, oh my goodness, Maybe that's what this passage of scripture means or whatever. Then you go back and look at the commentaries. And um, in other words, l the life of the community forces you to think harder than you might have done if you were simply being a detached 
um, academic brain, as it were. We've captured a number of comments uh, and questions that people have raised in the audience, and so we're going to take a couple of those tonight before we close. So I think they're going to be flashed up on the screen if we want to receive our first question. Dr. Wright rightly emphasizes the need to think theologically in order to move toward unity and holiness. What also is the role of the Holy Spirit in establishing our unity and holiness? Yeah. You know, submitting questions, we're advised to do. We'll save them until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, so many areas of Christian life thought practice, um, sometimes in the New Testament, it can be said entirely in terms of the Spirit, Sometimes it can be said in terms entirely of, of what people do. And when you get those passages which draw them together, you get strange passages like Romans 8, where the Spirit bears witness with our spirit, and we're never quite sure sometimes whether to put a capital S or not. And, and that, I think, tells us something very important, that when the Holy Spirit is at work, um, this doesn't rule out or cancel human thinking, agency, etc. I mean, the Spirit can do whatever the Spirit wants to do. Sometimes the Spirit can blast through and force an issue on us. But it seems that in the New Testament itself, and certainly in the long experience of the church, the signs of the Spirit being at work are not that people just float along and ideas happen and whatever, but that they do the hard work. Um, and this happens at every level of church life. I once worked with somebody who was absolutely a brilliant man, but who had no strategic thinking at all about him. And it's actually very difficult to work with somebody like that because his answer to every problem was he would go and pray about it, and then, bang, this would happen, and believed in the Holy Spirit. And I, I would say, well, actually, I find that often the Spirit seems to work when I sit down with a pencil and paper and say, suppose we do this, and suppose it works like that. And it's got, I think it's got to be a both and. Um, it, it's, it is difficult because I want to emphasize the sovereignty of the Spirit, but, but precisely because of who the Spirit is and who we are as human beings, the Spirit's sovereign work enhances our humanness rather than destroying it, and part of that enhancing is the work of transformed thinking. Tommy or Marianne? My initial uh, thought was, why wouldn't we say more about economy? About? Economy in relation to the Spirit. So often when Paul invokes the Spirit, it seems to me it is about how people are being empowered to share with one another, uh, the gifts that they are as a body of people, but also the material possessions that they uh, have some limited control over. And so I think these days we get away with talking about unity in a very cheap manner because it doesn't actually involve any kind of rigorous commitment to economic sharing with one another. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I wonder if here our Christian rhetoric might be disciplined by Paul yeah. so that we're forced to say when we mean one community, we mean this kind of coming to the aid of one another uh, economically, materially, sharing of possessions that cuts very hard against the grain of our social and economic formations. I, I, I just two very quick comments on that. First, yeah, in First Thessalonians, um, when Paul says, I know that you already love one another, but I want you to do it more and more, as I've often said to students, he doesn't mean I know you have warm, fuzzy feelings for one another. I want you to have even warmer and fuzzier feelings for one another. He means, I know you're already doing this practical sharing. Please, will you work at developing that? So much so that you then run in the Thessalonian correspondence into the difficulties of people who think, oh, good, uh, we get a free lunch here. Um, let's just sign on. And, and already, right in the very beginning of the church, that wouldn't, the danger of freeloading wouldn't happen unless the church was that sort of community. The second thing to say is that had I wanted to make the book just a little bit longer, because it was, after all, rather short, um, there, there could have been a whole chapter on economics, but happily Bruce Longenecker's book, Remember the Poor, a plug for a great recent book, Bruce Longenecker, who's now teaching at Baylor, Remember the Poor, which is about basically the economics of Paul's gospel. And that's something, as you say, we've completely screened it out, and I pr probably should have included stuff in, in the book on that, a little bit in chapter 16, but nothing much. Yeah. Marianne, did you want to add I don't know that I have uh, a lot that I was thinking of the phrase, uh, you know, to set the mind on the spirit mm -hmm. is, 
And then if you, that's the right translation. It will, okay, if it's the yeah, right translation. Yeah, well, it's, to, it's, to, it's, to, it's to phronima to plumentos, isn't it? So the mind of the, the spirit. The mind of the spirit, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Mm. You, you would get much the same thing. In other yeah. words, there's, a, there's a, an orientation of self to the spirit so that the spirit affects the things that we've set our minds on. And mm. so, so when you ask the question, where does the spirit enter in, the complexity of it, that mm. the spirit is what works in us to affect the things that we also set our minds on. Yeah, 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 that's important. I mean, uh, but, but the, very, the very fact that it's difficult to translate what yeah. Paul is saying there is an indication that something is uh, very close up for him, which our natural thought patterns um, resi resist and, and, and kind of pushing back against. And but that's partly what you mean by theology as well, exactly. that living and, and how one, how, yeah. how the spirit changes our minds, not just our minds, but how it affects our living, our, yeah, our, 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 our right. fellowship mm -hmm. and those right. things as well. Right. Uh, right? I mean, by theology, you mean... The whole thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean... First Corinthians 13 would be an example of it, doing theology. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. And, and I mean, here I, I am, I suppose, very much on all fours with some of the Greek Orthodox writings and going right back to the patristic period for whom theologia is, is the task of prayer, it's the task yeah. of the whole church, um, and it includes um, the very hard-nosed intellectual explorations and expositions, but that's not something other than the life of prayer. And, and I, I was determined, and finally I found the way to do it, to bring the book to a close mm. by showing that Paul is a man of prayer and that for him prayer and theology are very much the same thing. I mean, let, let me just say this because it's, it's directly related to that. We've mentioned Romans 9 to 11. Romans 9 to 11 begins and ends with prayer yeah. and those prayers are very much in the Jewish prayer mode. You begin with lament and you end with praise and halfway between those at the beginning of Romans 10 is intercession. So that's one of the greatest theological set pieces anywhere in Paul and it is framed as and structured as one whole prayer. And, uh, you know, we, we forget that at our peril, I think. Let's take just one more question tonight. If Paul was writing a letter to the church in America today, what warnings and admonitions, encouragements and affirmations do you think he'd give? <laughs> Let's hear the affirmations, Tom. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the affirmations are, um, you know, there's this great college in Pasadena, and I'm so glad you people are doing this stuff. Um, I think come to Fuller would be the yeah, exactly, slogan. Exactly, right? that's what I meant, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I, I've said it last night, and I've said it, I'll say it again. I think our easy collusion with disunity would not just dismay him, it, he would just be unable to comprehend how the Christian church had got to the point where it really didn't matter that people drove off on Sundays past this church because they wanted to go to that one and so on. But for him, being church is being part of a community. And, you know, he just wouldn't see that going on in many places. He would, he would in some places, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, and oh, I say in America, okay, but we do this in Britain as well. It's just that America is so much larger and everything is expanded. Um, I, I think as well, we mentioned the Enlightenment, um, there's a huge swathe of what I see as a Brit coming to America quite frequently of Enlightenment subculture, um, the split level world of the Enlightenment, the Epicurean world, which sees gods as a long way away and we're just doing stuff down here, which then plays out in church state discussions, etc. cetera. Um, I think and again, we in Britain are partly guilty of this, but not as much as some of the Enlightenment nations like America or France. Um, it's been so much part of the American culture that it is taken yeah. for granted. And there are so many other things which go with that culture, which um, I think he would just be unable to comprehend how Christians couldn't make a priority of, say, the care of the poor. Um, that's so basic in the New Testament. And I know many, many churches in America do actually make the poor a priority, but structurally and in terms of how you order society, I think you would say, we've all got a long way to go. And, and we in Britain have as well. I'm very careful to say that because it's not we're getting it right. Tommy or Marianne, do you want to add? Yeah, I, uh, Tom, I asked you this earlier, and so I raised it again for the sake of discussion. Um, Tom, Paul would show up in America and uh, be dismayed at the unity of the church. Oh, disunity. disunity. Mm -hmm. What 
What do you think he would need to see concretely, small, big? What would it look like for him not to be dismayed? In other words, presumably not, you know, either one giant church or, uh, in other words, what, what would it be that would constitute for him yeah. a, a, an adequate expression, a faithful yeah. expression yeah. of the one body of Christ? Uh, I, I think Paul would want to see eventually or want to see people aiming at, I mean, the, the idea of one giant church sounds monolithic, megalithic, a bit totalitarian. But people and, often think that unity, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. sort of... Well, yes, at the same time, um, that sort of unity has its dangers, but disunity is far, far more dangerous. I mean, in my country, and I suspect here, one of the reasons that politicians and the media can take very little notice of the church is because we're not speaking with one voice. Mm -hmm. So at least if the churches, such as they are, were able to try to speak with one voice on major issues, and I know how difficult that would be. Um, on the other hand, there are some issues which we, we could try to do that. I mean, where we are at the moment is not one step away from where we ought to be. It's probably about 20 or 200 mm -hmm. steps away from where we ought to be. And the real question is if we were to think prayerfully about supposing there were to be a new, richer kind of multi-layered unity a hundred years from now, what steps would we have had to take in the year of grace 2014 in order that by 2114, if the Lord has not returned by then, there would be a much richer unity? And I have to say the good news is we've taken a lot of those steps already in my lifetime. 50 years ago, it was unthinkable that we would have the kind of easy commerce between denominations we have today. Thank God for the progress we've made. The trouble is at the moment, as we make progress, in my own denomination, we've done wonderful work with Roman Catholic um, dialogue, for instance. But as we do that, we're hamstrung because stuff in our own communion mm -hmm. is going badly wrong on other fronts. And so unity and holiness, these two pull against one another, it seems. Um, but shared Bible study locally is possible, desirable, why aren't we doing it, you know, even as a Lenten course, okay, you may be able to, 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 to make it last for six weeks, go for it, you know, do it, plan it for next year, um, with the other churches in your locality, actually say, could we get together in groups and do shared by, why not, um, you know, it, that can only be good, shared Eucharistic fellowship as much as is absolutely possible and probably a bit more push the boundaries a bit because i think galatians tells you you should um and uh, and so on do together everything you can do together and then see what grows out of that prayerfully that would be my my plea just on this trying to stay on this question uh it seems to me that here in the u.s uh we're very drunk on a certain kind of power and Sometimes uh, the way that Paul is read uh, feeds that. Uh, and I worried a little bit as I was hearing you say over and over again about how Paul outflanks every existing philosophy, every existing idea, takes Aristotle captive. And it seems to engender this sort of hubris, I think, in the U.S. in particular, where we think, well, we can read Paul and we don't really need to read Aristotle anymore. He sort of <laughs> overtook Aristotle and we get all of that in Paul. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be really in keeping with the central place of the cross and the fact that we should always expect to meet God as a kind of scandal in our life that will never leave us uh, steady where we are, but always invite us to learn from what exceeds us. Uh, that seems to me to also be in keeping with the spirit of the Jewish exile uh, as well. So I wonder if we might be able to speak to this tendency by paying a little bit more attention to the rhetorical nature of Paul's writings. Uh, I remember one time I was told by a professor at Duke that when I was studying there that Romans 9 to 11 was an utter anomaly. <laughs> at cross purposes, it seemed, with everything else that Paul was writing. And it seemed to me like that could only be said because the rhetoric, for example, of Galatians, so spicy, was being flattened out into some kind of easy, overarching statement about everything. Um, well, 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 so how Romans, to pay attention? Was, What's that? Was, was that professor saying that Romans 9 to 11 was an easy, overarching statement? Uh, no. He, the, this professor seemed to think that if we didn't have Romans 9 to 11, uh, you know, we would have no resistance whatsoever in Paul to Christian supersessionism. Mm 
And it seemed to me like that was just an underestimation of the rhetorical nature of Paul's writing elsewhere about Abraham, mm -hmm. about the law, these kinds of things. But my, my point going to the questioner here is I wonder if the way that we have ignored the sort of rhetorical nature of Paul's writings and the nature of the cross and even self-effacement in that rhetoric uh, plays into a problem that we have uh, in the U.S. where he might say to us what he says to the, the Corinthians, that's not what I was telling you in the letter. <laughs> that's not what I meant you to do. Uh, I wasn't talking about getting rid of everyone, uh, but only one who is a so-called brother among you and behaving in this way among you. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, uh, I do. There's a sort of style of reading. I think it's rather like the point you made earlier, and it's very, very helpful, um, that I think what's happened you know, with the prison letters, say Colossians, um, that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, Paul is writing this from prison, um, you know, and, and when he talks about, in, in Ephesians, the, the, the great cosmic vision that he has, again, he's writing this from prison. And we have to put Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 together with Ephesians 6, that this is the battle that we're in right now. Um, and, and so it's much more complicated. And if we just take a few verses from Ephesians 1 or from Colossians, or indeed from some of the other letters, and then if we filter them through our natural tendency in our culture, whether in my British culture or your American culture, to say, okay, we've got it, we're right, um, the rest of the world's wrong, then of course that's immediately going to fall foul and trip over its own feet. The danger is that in reacting against that abuse, we want to tone down or flatten out the extraordinary cosmic statements that Paul is making. I, I think an antidote for this could be Philippians 4, where Paul says, whatever is true, lovely, honourable, beautiful, noble, good report, any virtue, any praise, think about this stuff. And he doesn't mean if that's in the church. He's looking out at the wider world. He mm. wants them to be good citizens, good neighbours, to celebrate all the good that is there. The next sentence, though, he says, what you are to do is what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. In other words, there's a generous celebration of all the goodness of God in culture, not to imagine we've got it all in our little huddle, but at the same time, that shouldn't lead to a moral relativism. So, well, if it's all good out there, let's just go and do what they do. And that, that's a very interesting balance right there. But Philippians has that wonderful generosity of spirit about it, even though that too is written from prison. <laughs> This is bringing our conversation tonight to a close. So uh, we have an opportunity to stand and, and join together in one final song. I want to say a thank you very much, Tom, for your lecture tonight. And to Marianne and to Tommy, thank, thank you. Please join me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.